BRProud.com Color Crossroads presents Race, Politics, and Community Policing. Good evening, I'm Dion Guillory. We are in the middle of a political season that has been called one of the most important elections in our lifetime and also the scariest. This is happening in the wake of many instances where black people are fighting for their right to live. In tonight's installment of Color Crossroads, we're taking a closer look at the history of voters' rights here in Louisiana, as well as looking closer at the ballot ahead of the November 3rd election. Also, we'll tell you how a local organization is using its platform to bring communities closer together. This is Color Crossroads, race, politics, and community policing. Think back to those conversations you've had with older family members. You know the ones where they tell you the stories of growing up during segregation or marching during the civil rights movement. Those times were not that long ago. The right to vote comes with birth. However, people of color have fought and died for that. One of the deadliest accounts of voter suppression in the Reconstruction era happened here in Louisiana, just an hour away from Baton Rouge and Opelousas. According to History.com, in September 1868, a dispute over a column published in the Landry Progress, a Republican newspaper in Opelousas, ignited a firestorm. 18-year-old Emerson Bentley wrote an article that described the attack by the Seymour Knights against black Democrats in the neighboring town of Washington. Black in St. Landry Parish were hoping to join the Democratic Party because they felt their needs for equality were not being met. Bentley hoped this message would persuade blacks to remain loyal to the Republican Party. Shortly after the article was published, he was brutally beaten by three men in front of a class he was teaching. Bentley left town and ran north. Blacks thought he had been killed and they banded together to retaliate. When they headed toward the parish seat, they were met by a group of armed men who were Democrats and were rallied by the Knights of the White Camellia, a white supremacy group determined to defend their town of Opelousas. Now, at the time, there were gun laws restricting gun ownership by blacks. And because of that, the Democrats had the overwhelming advantage. Twenty-nine black prisoners were captured. All but two of them were executed, and that is what started the massacre. The murders of blacks continued for several weeks, leading historians to believe up to 400 blacks were killed. History books have never told me about the Opelousas massacre, because get this, if you don't really know, I was born in Opelousas and spent a lot of my childhood there and never knew about this. And that is why we are doing this special, and that's why it's so important to vote. With that, here's a look at voting locations across the area.
We're just days away from the 2020 election and the amendments on your ballot can get a little confusing. So BR Proud is committed to helping you understand what's on the ballot before you make it to the polls. And joining me now to further explain each amendment you will see on your ballot is Albert Samuels, chair of the Southern University Department of Political Science and Criminal Justice. Good evening and thanks for joining us for this. Thank you very much. Okay, so what we're going to do is, so there are seven amendments and there's also uh, a proposition. And so what we're going to do is going to go amendment each one one by one mm -hmm. and you'll see that they are in a form of a question because the way you'll vote is yes or no so let's start with the first one do you support an amendment declaring that to protect human life a right to abortion and the funding of abortion shall not be found in the louisiana constitution now this one's very controversial explain what this means okay uh again thank you for for, for having me uh, obviously, the issue of abortion is very controversial, and because because there is concern that Roe v. Wade uh, decision was legalized abortion may be overturned, especially if the Supreme Court is, is uh, make up its make up its change. Louisiana already has a law that says that if Louisiana if, if Roe v. Wade were to become unconstitutional, then we have a, a law that says that then. Abortion would then be, would become illegal in the state of Louisiana. However, there are those who support this amendment say that doesn't go far enough. Mm -hmm. They argue that there are parts of the, of the state constitution that could be interpreted by a judge, say the right to privacy, for example, or uh, the right to due process, that a judge could potentially interpret as protecting the right to an, an abortion. And so what they want to do is to preclude that possibility and to, and to specifically state in the Constitution that, 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 uh, that no part of the Constitution protects a right to an, an, an abortion. So, so that's what it's designed to do. Uh, there are other states that already have uh, protections in the Constitution mm -hmm. that protect the right to abortion. And so the supporters of this amendment want to make sure that the, that that doesn't happen in Louisiana. Yeah, and the key there is having it in the state constitution. Correct. Okay, all right, let's move on to the second amendment that you will find on your ballot. It is, do you support an amendment to permit the presence or production of oil or gas to be included in the methodology used to determine the fair market value of an oil or gas well for the purpose of property assessment? That's a very long question, slightly confusing. Clear that one up. Yeah, yeah. Currently, currently in Louisiana right now, what we what what uh, we we primarily tax us. We have several taxes on oil and gas. Now, when it comes to now the uh, local property taxes can be assessed on oil well, but for some reason the way, way the Constitution is worded, uh, we haven't worded in a way that the actual market. Actually, the amount of production of the well itself can be taxed, okay. and so it's, it's created sort of an arcane process of local governments trying to figure out how to tax the oil wells. And it's led to a lot of conflicts, led to a lot of lawsuits, and so this is an attempt uh, to clarify this by saying that uh, that the that the market value, uh, uh, the market value, if you will, of the of the of what's produced in a particular well can be used in part of the calculation for how much you tax an individual well. Mm -hmm. And so in some cases that may mean that some wells might be taxed more because they produce more, and some might be taxed less because they produce less. Right. So, some, so for some people argue that this is it's a more rational way uh, of, of dealing, with, dealing with a problem that's led to a lot of conflict and okay. confusion. Instead of an even tax across the board. Right. Got it, okay. Um, third amendment, it's do you support an amendment to allow for the use of the budget stabilization fund, also known as the rainy day fund, for state costs associated with a disaster declared by the federal government? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, th this is an issue that actually in, 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 has come up also in particularly and also in line of COVID-19 and also we, 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 also have a, we tend to have hurricanes and other, other disasters. Pretty busy season this year. And a pretty busy season this year actually. And so uh, right now we have a budget stabilization fund, the, the rainy day fund. There are restrictions as to what it can be used for and how much of the fund that can be used. 
And so what this would do is that it would, it would amend that by saying that if we have a federally declared disaster, disaster, that that would be one of the allowable uses for monies to come out of the Rainy Day Fund. Now, it wouldn't change the other provisions that relate to the Rainy Day Fund, t such as uh, how, uh, like, like the majorities that you would need in the legislature to tap into it, mm -hmm. but it would just simply say that in the case of a federally declared dis disaster, that that would be one of the allowable uses, you know, of, 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 some, of some, some of those dollars, you know. Um, supporters say that let's let, let's say for example we have a disaster and for, uh, for some reason we need to get a federal match, which means that the state has to put up some of the money. Well, if we don't have the funds available in the general fund, uh, without the ability to say go into say the, the rainy day fund and get extra funds, then we would miss out on the federal match. Okay. And that way, we have the money, and the federal government would match it, and then we would get the we'll get the uh, resources that the state needs to deal with the, with the particular problem that we're dealing with. Okay. All right. The next amendment: uh, Do you support an amendment to limit the growth of the expenditure limit for the state general fund and dedicated funds, and to remove the calculation of its growth factor from the Constitution? I'm sure a lot of people watching this are trying to figure out what does that mean. So. That's why we've got you. <laughs> yeah, well, a actually, it is, it is sort of complex. And actually, this is probably one of those issues that it just should have done itself. Mm -hmm. But basically, right now, the way the Constitution is set, set, set up, there is a, a growth factor that is tied to the growth of personal income that is used to set the expenditure limit, which is how much the government can spend in a particular fiscal year. Now, the supporters of this amendment argue that our government is growing too fast. Mm -hmm. And so what they're proposing to do is to take that out of the Constitution and then have the legislature create a formula, a, a, another formula, and they actually propose a formula that's a, that, that takes some more factors into account. Uh, the effect of that probably in the short term would be that it would probably slow the growth of government. Uh, to, you know, you know, to, to some, some degree, mm -hmm. depending on how much that is, that actually could be quite significant. So it depends on if you think that the growth of government is a good thing or a bad thing as to whether or not you think it's a good idea. But it's, it's, it's sort of technical, but that's basically what it is. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that one's probably the most technical okay. one of them. All right, let's move on to the next amendment. Do you support an amendment to authorize local governments to enter into cooperative endeavor ad valorem tax exemption agreements with new or expanding manufacturing establishments for payments in lieu of taxes? Now, I had to look this one up a couple of times in order mm -hmm. to understand it. I slightly understand it. Maybe you can clear it up a little more for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Currently, right now in Louisiana, we have something called the Industrial Tax Exemption Program, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, gives a lot of people know it as ITEP. Which, which we're known as ITEP, mm -hmm. like we're known as, known as ITEP. You know, which basically creates a, creates a, uh, a, a, a you know creates tax breaks to uh, to new or expanding facilities within local jurisdictions around around the state of Louisiana. Uh, it usually lasts for about lasts for about ten years. This has been I mentioned some some real controversy, particularly lately. Mm -hmm. What this would do would be it would give uh, it, would, it would create it would create an additional option, whereas uh, whereas uh, these manufacturers could enter into agreements with local governments, you know, in lieu of or as a substitute for the uh, property tax assessment that they, that, that they would be due once their exemption ended, uh, you know, as a, you know, and, and so, so this, you know, there are some local entities like uh, church association, there's the municipal associations, uh, school board associations who say this is a good idea. Some of them say this is a good idea because uh, rather than having to wait 10 years, for example, for the for the exemption to end, they could get dollars front loaded. Oh, okay. And and that could be used for other uh, expenses. Mm -hmm. They could use it as as leverage to you know to bond out for uh, uh, other capital capital projects. And so some people say that, that, that that's a good idea. Uh, there are also other groups who also argue you know like together Baton Rouge, together Louisiana, and also some assessors who argue that this is basically a huge tax cut 
for for corporations, and that over the life of these uh, over the life of these agreements, uh, that local governments would be deprived of millions of dollars in tax revenue that they would otherwise get uh, if we keep things where they are. Okay. Yeah, it's one of those things you got to weigh what your beliefs are and to make a decision on that one. All right, our next amendment, do you support an amendment to increase the maximum amount of income a person may receive and still qualify for the special assessment level for residential property receiving the homestead exemption? All right, explain that one. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know uh, basically we have some, some, some special uh, property tax exemptions right now that apply to men and Louisiana residents, uh, particularly, particularly for those who are over age 65, mm -hmm. uh, you know, th those who are the, like the, the spouses of uh, uh, widows of, of, of veterans and, and what have you. And basically what this amendment does is that it will actually increase the income limit that for a person to qualify for that. Right now it's around $50,000 and this would increase it to 100000 Okay, mm -hmm. so giving, it would, if, Y if it enough yeses are given to this, it would give more people the opportunity to be to qualify qualified. for this, this, this particular tax break. Yeah. Okay. All right. Our next amendment: Do you support an amendment to create the Louisiana Unclaimed Property Permanent Trust Fund to preserve the money that remains unclaimed by its owners or owner? And that one is one that's been a little popular in the last year or two because we we hear a lot of times about the unclaimed property and a lot of people not knowing that they do have unclaimed property. So this goes into with, with that, when, when people don't know that they do have unclaimed property or they haven't claimed it. Right, and actually I was like, we we said in this, I was actually surprised by just how many millions of dollars are in unclaimed property that, you know, that basically are, are not basically claimed right. uh, during the actual year. And what, and, I, and what I also was not aware of is that uh, when money is not claimed, technically the state, of Louis, uh, 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 the state you know, can actually use some of that money in operating budget, mm -hmm. operating budget of Louisiana. And sometimes that actually has been done. And so what this amendment proposes to do is to create a permanent trust fund, a trust fund for those on claim dollars. The argument here is that this money is actually the owner's money, not the state's money. And so that's where the money should, should go as opposed to actually potentially being used as part of the state uh, general fund. Got it. Okay, so we've gone through the seven amendments. Now, the one proposition that is on the ballot, uh, shall sports wagering activities and operations be permitted in the parish of blank? And the reason why it's blank is because this one, if passed, it will depend on the parishes. So explain that one. Yeah. Uh, a few years ago, you know, the Supreme Court basically uh, basically said that sports betting is, you know, an actually actually legalized sports betting. Now, of course, it gave states it gave states the the ability, you know, the ability to decide whether they want to implement it or not, mm -hmm. you know. But you know, but in other words, laws that prohibited state that actually prohibited it said were, were unconstitutional. But it gave us, each state had the opportunity to, to adopt this. And so what, what's happening in Louisiana is that what Louisiana decided to do is to give each parish essentially a local option. That you can decide within your parish whether or not you want to use sports, uh, you want to legalize sports, be sports betting. And so the, the, the supporters of this argue, argue that Louisiana, we might as well do this because uh, this is going on anyway and uh, a lot of our sports betting dollars are going to Mississippi and uh, Mississippi and Arkansas and mm -hmm. other states that have legalized it. And so they looking at the dollars and saying some of those dollars could be recaptured here in Louisiana. Uh, so, but it's gonna depend, the way it's worded, it's gonna depend on what each parish decides to do, whether it's legal or not. Now, should it pass in your parish, it wouldn't become legal immediately because the state would still have to create some regulations regarding it, uh, which could probably happen as soon as probably the next regular session of legislature. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what it is. This is a local option. It gives uh, each citizen of each parish the opportunity to decide if they want to allow uh, uh, sports betting 
uh, within their parish. Yeah, that's probably the one on the ballot that's getting the most attention um, because there are commercials running. If, if you're a sports fan, you've seen the commercials for them, of course, sports, they would put the commercial for that in there. And there are also the flyers in the mail form as well. And that's often, uh, uh, and, you know, and, and obviously there are establishments that stand to benefit mm -hmm. from the legalizing of, uh, legalizing of, uh, of, you know, of sports betting. And of course, those who oppose to it argue that Louis Louisiana already has more forms of legal gambling than any state in the union. And also, we have one of the highest incidences of gambling addiction right. in the country. And so the opponents of this argue that this would just simply uh, add to what's already a significant social problem in the state of Louisiana. Yeah, definitely. We would just have to wait and see what the voters say. Uh, Albert Samuels, thank you so much for joining us and explaining these very complicated uh, propositions and uh, the amendments that we have on our ballot. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. All right, and so uh, as we continue our conversation about voting, here's a look at some more voting locations around the area. Politics and policing go hand in hand. We've seen during the civil rights movement, police being used to intimidate blacks from voting. Now, policing means something different in our community. There have been more than 100 deadly shootings in East Baton Rouge Parish so far this year, and one organization has been on the ground working to help keep communities safer and give young people a second chance at living a positive and fulfilling life. Joining me is Aishala Burgess, Executive Director for Truce. Good evening and thank you for joining Hi, us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, I know that Truce has been around for a couple of years, but for the people who are watching this who don't know, tell them what is Truce. So Truce is a nonprofit. We help young people 14 to 24 that may be involved in groups or gangs in our city. They may be on probation or parole, or maybe it's a young person that dropped out of school. And we have two full-time social workers that work hand in hand with each client that we may service. And our goal is to remove as many barriers as we can, not only from for that young person, but for that entire family. Mm -hmm. So we provide Uber services um, to any type of medical appointments, any type of court proceedings, um, anywhere if they're if they're in need to go to school. Um, that's something that we do. And we also make sure that they receive the necessary referrals for mental health and substance abuse treatment. Um, and we provide education assistance and um, job assistance yeah. as well. There's lots of things there that a lot of us um, who are a little more fortunate may not think right. others need. Right. Um, how has Truce been able to make a difference in the communities? So our main, our main goal is that we provide a lot of, um, a lot of hope to a lot of people and young um, young adults um, that most people probably would write off. So um, one of our amazing success stories um, where I can tell you that we're really making a difference is that we had a young person that came in that was shot seven times and um, decided that he wanted to do something different. And he graduated from oh, wow. the North Baton Rouge um, initiative in the electrical per program at BRCC. So our goal is just to go into whatever community that we can 
and encourage young people that may not be on the right track, that there is hope and there's always an opportunity for a second chance. Yeah, definitely. And what you're, well, the video that we were seeing is that you guys do a lot of canvassing yes. around the area, <laughs> and that's part of the uh, initiative for community policing. It is. Um, explain why this is so important. So the canvassing is so important in that um, our goal was to go into a community that was plagued by violence and show that community that, that we're here from them, for them, to hear from the residents of the community of what's going on in your neighborhood and how can we, how can we help. But our goal was to bring um, business leaders, faith-based, other nonprofit organizations or social service providers to that particular area for you to see and interact with so many people because so often we find that the interaction with law enforcement and the community is probably on the worst uh, mm -hmm. moment in your entire life. And our, our, our goal was to come in and, and allow the law enforcement officers and the community to have that conversation. But more importantly, we wanted, there are some people that never travel to certain areas of our community. And we wanted to show them that while you may hear a lot um, of these particular neighborhoods on the news because of statistics and the bad, that they're really good individuals living in those neighborhoods and they want the same things that all of us will want for our children in our own community and that's safety. Right, definitely, that's number one. Um, in addition to that, and I know you named several of them, but what are some of the other initiatives that Truce is involved in? So we are so excited. Um, we're involved in our neighborhood canvassing. We also have Beat the Heat. So Beat the Heat is our summer series uh, where our goal was to provide kind of summer camp um, to young people that may not be able to afford mm -hmm. summer camp. Mm -hmm. So we would pop up in a, a different neighborhood every week. Um, and we would have snowballs, we would have food for them, we would allow our different law enforcement agencies maybe to bring in your canine dogs, our Mountie Patrol, um, our helicopter divisions, um, just to kind of break up the cycle of violence that we noticed in some of the communities. Mm -hmm. And that will lead to our um, Hoop Fest which was an amazing event that we would put on pre-COVID and we're hoping that at some point we can get back to that. And that's a free three on three basketball tournament that we would put on for the city of Baton Rouge so that a lot of our kids that are, may not be involved in organized sports will have an opportunity to participate. And the amazing part is that our law enforcement officers are the referees. Right. So that gives them an opportunity to interact again with law enforcement and see them in a different light. Right, not that worst day that worst day of your life mm -hmm, definitely um, there's also a new project uh, truce has uh, yes. we want to uh, take a quick look at that it's one thought at a time right like for me I tell myself when I go to work when I go to football practice I, I remind myself to work on one thing right like I'm not trying to overload myself I'm not trying to overwhelm myself or put any extra stress or pressure on myself I just remind myself what do I want to do today do I want to not curse? Do I want to smile more? Uh, do I want to show up to meetings five minutes early? You know what I mean? Do I want to talk to one of my teammates who I've never said two words to? Like, you know, what am I going to work on today that's going to help me shift to the person that I truly want to be? And that's a clip from the speaking engagement series called The Shift. And that was a familiar face there, Tyron Tyre Matthew, who used to play football at LSU, now yes. is in the NFL. Uh, what is this about and how can people watch? Awesome. So The Shift is our new initiative that we started once COVID hit. Um, because we were in the high schools during the school year, um, and our goal was to figure out how can we reach young people in that particular setting? How can we encourage them to finish school, stay in school, stay out of trouble? Um, and that was something that we would do. It was called One Lunch Wednesday at Terra High. Mm -hmm. So when COVID hit, we were sitting around trying to figure out how can we still reach our young people in a virtual setting um, but also maybe bring somebody on that they would be interested in talking to. Because we found that a lot of our youth, especially our youth involved in violence, they're not prone to go into a, a labeled mentoring program. Right. But if we can mentor them without them really feeling like they're in the midst of a program, mm -hmm. then that was our goal. And um, so we contacted Tyron and he said yes immediately. 
and he we started two weeks later and so we put it on social media we emailed coaches the flyers encouraging kids to get on and it is blossoming um, he comes on every other week and we talk about all things we talk about voting we talk about bullying we talk about um, living through adverse situations um, and we also talk about fun things like our younger kids they're interested in knowing what's your favorite candy right. do you play video games you know our athletes want to know the latest football maneuvers mm -hmm. um, and what can I do to enhance those skills and so it was just something so enlightening for for our youth because how often um, do you have that opportunity to have those intimate conversations with someone that you looked up to and and he's very transparent we all know if you're from Ben Rouge the things that he experienced while at LSU and he talks about that mm -hmm. he talks about having you know a father that's also incarcerated and how you can work through those issues as well so it's been the most satisfying <laughs> program um, that we have going right now and you can find out where we are on all of our social media handles which is truth underscore br um, because it is the nfl season and he is actively playing and of course we've seen with covid games are moving oh they're all over the place yes <laughs> and so we post the flyer on um on the day that we're gonna have the ship mm -hmm. normally it's a monday right now okay if he's not playing um and so people can pretty much find out um, how um, to participate in the shift. It's a great program. It's amazing. Uh, um, I'm so excited about the future for Truce and just all the things you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asia, for coming on and uh, telling people about this yes. program and all the great things you guys are doing for our community. Thank you for having us. It's right. a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, so, of course, our whole conversation has been about voting. And so here are a few more voting locations in our area. Thanks for joining us. We know that sometimes these conversations can be a little tough for some people, but we must always remember that they are necessary in order for all of us to grow. We hope that you have learned enough tonight that will help you make solid decisions when you do go to the polls. And remember, we are in the final days of early voting and Election Day is next Tuesday, November 3rd. I'm Dion Guillory, and as always, stay positive and keep pressing forward. Good night.